So welcome everyone to the, uh, the VLUX Pavilion here at the UIA Congress. And uh, I'm really excited to, to be here today uh, moderating this session all about the role of healthy buildings and efficient buildings in addressing the energy crisis. And we've got a fantastic panel with us, uh, so we're going to have a really good discussion. Great mix of public sector and private sector views. But uh, uh, let me introduce myself first. My name is Cassie Sutherland, and I'm the Managing Director at C40 Cities. And C40 is a network of nearly 100 of the world's largest cities that are all coming together to collaborate to, to tackle the, uh, the climate crisis. And uh, with the overall mission of working to halve emissions by 2030, while increasing equity and increasing climate resilience to, to impacts. So, let me maybe just give a couple of minutes of framing and then I'll go to introducing my wonderful panel. We're all looking lovely, sat here in this lovely building. Um, so, we're in an energy crisis. I think we, all, we are all aware of that. We're in a global energy crisis. It's, it's fueled by volatile fossil fuel prices, uh, but also the invasion of Ukraine, which has caused a ripple effect around the world. And the consequence of that is rising energy costs, and those particularly hitting or biting on, on the most vulnerable and those on the lowest incomes. So we've got a, con a crisis that's kind of spanning multiple sectors and people. And since 2021, because of this crisis, European countries have uh, provided 700 billion euros of support, of relief to residents with their bills. And of course, that's much needed, but it's interesting to think about the scale of that kind of investment. And, and the scale is equivalent to retrofitting around 8% of the buildings across central, northern, and southern Europe. So, you know, that we, of course the relief was needed, but how could we invest further money and further funds into actually having a longer term reduction and tackling of the energy crisis? And we really, across Europe, need to see a, a rapid increase in the rate of retrofit and uptake. I think we're around 1% uh, rate of retrofit per year, and that needs to rapidly increase to 3% uh, pretty, pretty starkly. And of course, we're seeing this, this consequence in the US as well, where buildings are responsible for almost 35% of the emissions. And we know that retrofit uh, at all sorts of different scales, whether it's a relatively light touch or deep, fit, deep retrofit, is going to reduce uh, bills and energy use significantly. So I, I know we're all the converted, right? So we know that building retrofit delivers health benefits. It delivers job creation. It delivers cost reduction. It delivers well-being effects. But I think our challenge here today is to say, well, how do we therefore massively increase that acceleration of implementation in retrofit and really get it going and delivering and realizing those kind of benefits? So let me introduce the panel and get into the discussion. Uh, so I'm delighted to be joined by Monica Conrad, uh, who is the uh, head of municipal spatial planning from Warsaw. Welcome, Monica. Welcome. Uh, by Zach Aders, the Vice President of the New York City Economic Development Commission. By Simai uh, Arakan, the Senior Director of Business Development and Exploration at Velux. And Rasmus Christiansen, the Vice President, Head of Public Affairs at Danfoss. So yeah, I think we're going to have a great chat today. So I'm going to ask you all to kind of set the scene for us. Why is this topic important to you, to your organization? And then we're going to get into some really good questions and discussion. So maybe, Simai, I can, I can start with you and ask you to, to give us a bit of an introduction about what you think the principles of healthy buildings can really do uh, to accelerate that implementation of retrofit and be kind of made more mainstream across our sector. Yes, and thank you. And, uh, but let me, I think, uh, first start with uh, explaining who we are as Velux and why it's basically uh, so close to our heart to work with these uh, topics around healthy and sustainable buildings. Um, as you know, we are a leading manufacturer of uh, roof windows and skylights, but uh, we do that with the purpose of creating well-being for people and planet through transforming spaces uh, through daylight and uh, fresh air. And if you also look at our uh, model company objective, which was uh, formulated back in 1965, which is still our guiding star, it tells us that a model company should work with products that is useful for society. And if you are looking at the most pressing challenges and issues we are facing today in the world with the climate change, energy crisis, health crisis, you know, if, um, products that are good for society means that we need to, as a company, address these challenges we are facing today with, again, sustainable and uh, the right uh, solutions that address these challenges. 
and uh, we need to act fast. We need to do that, uh, you know, now and through collaboration. And I want to also sort of like highlight uh, some of the data uh, that also, you know, uh, again, uh, explains why we need to actually do it uh, as soon as possible. Um, if we start with the climate change and uh, look at the role of our industry, we know that, uh, you know, uh, three quarters of Europe's uh, buildings are energy inefficient. And this is on its own responsible for 40 percent of Europe's uh, energy consumption and over a third of actually its CO2 emissions. And um, we also, as you mentioned, have learned that we need to triple our efforts in terms of like, you know, improving the energy efficiency of the buildings within the next decade compared to the uh, previous decade. And um, if we want to meet our climate goals, basically. And if we combine the crisis around the energy, um, um, energy crisis together with the uh, poor efficiency of the buildings, then we are also, you know, hearing facts like, you know, what The Economist was recently also uh, communicating, that the energy crisis actually might have killed more people than COVID. It's because people have not been sort of like uh, heating their homes properly with the concerns about uh, the cost for uh, energy. One in three Europeans are sort of like affected uh, by poor um, indoor climates in terms of like mold, damp, you know, um, lack of daylight, excessive noise, excessive cold, and this on its own actually um, both impacts our well-being, but also comes as a cost uh, in terms of health. But, um, and that's where we step in actually, and uh, we, we believe that we really need to work with uh, more holistic retrofitting strategies, as you also mentioned, uh, Kasia, and uh, we need to work together and then address these issues. And that's what we've been also doing with uh, C40. Uh, we have been, you know, working together with you in increasing the awareness about why we need to do these things. And we're also working on how we can address these things in a more systematic way. For example, the tool we have been creating together with C40 is identifying um, us, um, identifying and helping us in finding the, the right retrofit strategies by evaluating the impact of different strategies on the different benefits in terms of like health improvement, in terms of like, um, you know, job creation. And um, this will enable the cities as well to start at the right places to deliver into their own needs and to address the right things they need to address. It's a huge task, uh, but, and that's why we actually need to do this together. We need to bring the private and the public sector together. And uh, we need to, you know, lead this change by working together, understanding actually the challenges by talking to each other, but also by utilizing the private sector expertise that needs to be, you know, implemented to find the right solutions uh, for the problems we are facing. Thanks so much, Simai. It's really interesting. And yeah, we're, we're delighted with the tool that's been developed across C40 and Velux. And, and I think, as you said, the principle really being of how can we promote or kind of communicate health as an entry point to, exactly. to retrofit of buildings and upgrading our buildings. So it's not just seen as a, as a co-benefit and a nice to have, it's really front and center of, of that. No, exactly. Uh, so Rasmus, let me come to you. Uh, thank you for joining us. And so we'd really love to hear from you as uh, Dan Foss about the role of energy efficient technologies and really what role they can play in, in achieving healthy buildings and great outcomes. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me for the <coughs> debate today. Uh, just two words about uh, Danfoss. We are a multinational company uh, headquartered in uh, Denmark, working on uh, heating and cooling. That's uh, where it mainly becomes relevant for buildings, but we also deliver components for large construction machinery, um, including uh, electrifying them. Uh, and then uh, finally, we uh, work on uh, power electronics for especially electric vehicles, so the whole e-mobility uh, industry. So these are our free uh, business segments. Um, the energy crisis, I think, um, especially last year, was uh, in many ways uh, very interesting. Also uh, in the way that it, of course, immediately led to a discussion on what can we do as, as you framed it, Cassie, I think uh, a couple of interesting observations, uh, of, of course, uh, the more uh, problematic part being that suddenly a lot of families throughout Europe were uh, facing energy poverty in a way that we didn't 
thought would be possible um, at, at this point in, uh, in, in time. But also interesting to see what was actually uh, the reaction of governments to this uh, energy crisis and the problem. And I think there were two things that at least puzzled me a little bit in, in the government reaction to this. Uh, the first, as, as you pointed out, Cassie, was, was the amount of subsidies suddenly made available simply to pay the bills. Uh, instead of perhaps using those uh, funds to, uh, to do something that would uh, actually uh, uh, address the problem, which is that we, you know, many of our houses are, are incredibly inefficient, and, and, and that's, of course, part of the reasons for the, uh, that, that people pay, pay high prices. So the subsidies, uh, number one. The other puzzling thing I found uh, in the government reaction was an immediate focus on behavioral things basically telling families that you know the only way forward we think or the best way forward is for you to turn down the temperature in your houses put on a sweater and that's pretty much what you can do and i think as a as a technology company we <laughs> fundamentally disagree with that approach and i think we would probably argue that we can address this problem in a way that actually doesn't necessarily lead to discomfort for people, number one, but also perhaps as importantly, um, that we can make sure that the buildings and that we inhabit are, are in fact healthy, uh, that we don't, uh, they don't get damp or full of mold or, or what have you. So the technology is there, but I think for me, again, puzzling that it seems that governments were under the impression that all the low-hanging fruits had already been harvested, that there wasn't much you could do. Of course, you could do some deep retrofitting that everybody realized would be very expensive and take 10 years. And, and, and so it leading to a little bit of an apathy. And then on the one hand, we'll just dish out some subsidies and, and encourage through behavioral campaigns people to turn down the heat. Now, so what can we actually do about it? And I think uh, there's a lot of things we could do, but just to keep time uh, short here, just give you one example. Um, an old Danfoss invention that uh, actually we don't think we didn't think much of until last year because it's a minuscule part of our turnover and that not really what we do anymore. But suddenly it became uh, important again, namely the thermostat, uh, almost like a no-brainer. But I was really shocked when I saw the stats saying that in Europe, in the European Union, we have alone we have 500 million radiators without a thermostat. So basically, what they have is a mechanic valve where you just, either it's shut off or you open it. And that means that the radi radiator then runs at full speed. And then, you know, what happens is if it gets too hot in the room, people open the window. <laughs> so you can Im immediately see where this leads, right? Uh, a massive waste of, of, of energy. Um, and of course, people simply keeping the radiator shut because they couldn't afford to pay the bills. But just putting on a thermostat, it gives you an enormous uh, effect in terms of energy efficiency in the double-digit numbers. And again, here we are not talking about some complex thing that takes a long time to install, uh, invasive in the building, or uh, has a very long payback time. During the energy crisis, the payback time would be, I don't know, days probably. A thermostat, a mechanical thermostat, the simplest one, it still gives you a very high impact. It's 19, 15, 15 to 20 euros, depending on where you buy it. Of course, you could build on and, and get a digital smart thermostat that corresponds with the other thermostats in, in the room, and that gives you a higher impact, but of course, also more expensive. But the point here is there are actually technology available with a very short payback time, um, easy to install. People can almost do it themselves and with an immediate impact on energy efficiency in buildings, and hence would also contribute to lower the bills. Now, that was just an example, is, I think, and the, it, the point is, this is an example of a much wider ecosystem of technologies, controls, uh, solutions like windows that can be applied, and uh, most of them actually with short payback times. But it seems to me that there is still a lack of awareness in the ecosystem about what is possible. Uh, thank you, Rasmus. That stat has blown my mind, right? 500 million radiators without thermostats. And yeah. another 250 million that has a very, very old thermostat that, thermostat that is either not working or could be replaced with a more efficient newer one. Wow, okay, so 750 million uh, radiators to be improved. Room for improvement. Room for improvement. But, but what I also re you know, really appreciate from your opening remarks there is 
this using of technology that is available and needs to be applied in a way to solve these problems. You know, not always saying, do we need more and more solutions to be developed? We have so many solutions that are out there. And actually, you and I were just discussing this yesterday about, you know, there are so many solutions that are there. It's a matter of them being applied and, and also awareness being raised of them, isn't it? So thank you very much. Um, so, Zach, maybe I can now come to you to, to tell us a bit more about uh, the New York City initiatives and policies in this space of healthy buildings and retrofit. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm glad to be here from the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Uh, we're technically a private nonprofit that works directly for the city of New York, so we're tasked with implementing uh, New York City policies. And around healthy buildings in this conversation, um, a lot of what is in plan NYC uh, from the mayor is, number one, uh, protecting the city against climate crises. Uh, number two, um, improving the quality of life. And then number three, building a green economic engine. And so we touch on all of those things from the workforce development and economic development aspect, as well as implementation through capital projects, not only for the properties that we manage that are owned by the city, but for uh, city projects. So uh, when it comes to healthy buildings, uh, directly a lot of the initiatives that we do is are helping building owners deal with uh, meet the energy requirements of Local Law 97, which is reducing the emissions that are allowable from buildings, uh, working with the workforce to develop this new green workforce. Uh, we're doing a study right now trying to understand what that is, what the size of it is, and where you know, the biggest drivers are. And all of this really wrapped around prioritizing the communities and the people that live in the communities that have been most affected by climate change. Um, so working, doing, developing those workforces, finding ways to get them into the capital projects that we have. So that's really our big levers of change, uh, working with the, the industry, private and public, and then actually implementing them. Uh, so yeah, we're glad to be here. Uh, the, the radiators, this is funny, that's a big problem in New York, especially with the district steam. We've all lived with it. A uh, common saying is the hottest summer I've ever spent was winter in New York. Uh, and so yeah, you open your windows and that's how you deal with it. So uh, yeah, glad to be here and add to the conversation. Oh, thanks so much, Zach. And I'm so pleased you mentioned workforce development programs as well, because yeah. in, in my opinion, that's one of the huge barriers to, to being able to accelerate and actually achieve some of the targets we want to see. And I'd love us to get into some more conversations about workforce development later on. But Monica, last but by no means least, over to you to, to tell us a bit more about the policies and, and in, initiatives you have in Warsaw. I know there's amazing things happening in Warsaw at the moment to support those who need it the most and on fuel switching. So please tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, the, this is true. I, I'm actually working for urban planning department. I'm uh, responsible for like planning policy of Warsaw. Uh, that's in fact uh, what we really uh, want to achieve is to work like between scales because uh, to achieve quality of life that is our main goal in all the strategic documents uh, you have to look at the city as a whole and uh, we like to look uh, at Warsaw as an ecosystem ecosystem of buildings, people uh, greenery, animals, so we all together uh, have to form the city and coexist and uh, benefit from each other. So that's the very broad goal. But then if you're going down, uh, we are planning a city that is going to grow, so the demographic uh, forecast is actually that we, we are going to grow in the future, so we're expecting like up to 2050, around uh, 225,000 uh, uh, more of the inhabitants. But last year, uh, yeah, we had a big surprise. So we got during uh, one week 300,000 new inhabitants. So we know that what we have to do, it has to be like resilient. So we have to be ready for any scenario. At the moment, it's like 100,000 uh, refugees in Warsaw, so, so the numbers are changing, but of course we have to uh, accommodate everyone. But that's like uh, temporary, that, that can be later incorporated into the housing needs. Uh, but uh, yeah, we have different strategies. Uh, so some of them are, are of course focusing on uh, building itself. Uh, so now we are developing like green building standard. 
that is going to be a kind of apply immediately for the public buildings and for like social housing. And later on, we are hoping that, uh, well, we want to uh, have an impact on the whole city, so incorporate it into the permission, building permission. So we have to have certain standards to, to get building permission. But of course, we have to do it smartly uh, and not as well to stop development in the city. So now we are carefully kind of uh, putting the measures how it should be done and what we really want to achieve. Another uh, problem is actually quality of air that is in Warsaw, yeah, for some areas that uh, area quality of air is very poor, so almost not acceptable. And this is uh, like, uh, this comes for like uh, around 60% of inhabitants. So something has to be done very quickly. This is partly due to the smoke that is uh, during the winter very big in the city and partly uh, because of the linear pollution. So pollution from the cars that is like almost 50%. And 45% uh, it's uh, like surface pollution that is from our households. But this was ad addressed already in 2019. So all the uh, uh, heating systems that use coal are yeah, almost eliminated. Of course, there's uh, some problems. Uh, but... Uh, the problem is broader because the if municipality of Warsaw managed to deal with it, but uh, we got a lot of pollution for the surrounding area. So we need now metropolitan plan to, to, to deal with it and some broader actions. Another part is the linear pollution from car. Now we're having like a, a strategy, mobility strategy for the city and the region that was recently actually is uh, now operational. So there are different scales. Uh, we are as well uh, having like 40% of the housing stock is like multifamily housing uh, from like uh, seven, 60s, 70s, 80s. So this huge block of, uh, block of flats. So now we are working on how to improve this housing stock, how to make it uh, energy efficient. We have as well school standards uh, that is dealing with the, the quality of the environment inside school and uh, like uh, the, the number of uh, light that is coming in, ventilation and so on, but as well space. Uh, well, so it's it's pretty complex uh, approach, but I think it's still a lot to do. Yes, a, a lot to do. Thank you for setting out some of the, the challenges Warsaw are facing. I, I love your point at the start saying it's an ecosystem. And I think this is the amazing thing, isn't it, about working at a city level where you can really see that ecosystem playing out in front of you and understanding the impacts and knock-on effects of all of those different areas. And it was great, Monica, to hear you talking about air quality is really being the issue there, and almost no matter the source, you know, we've got to deal with all the sources of air quality from our buildings, from the transport, and there needs to be kind of strategic plans in place to deal with those. So, so thanks very much, it was really useful to hear. So I'm now gonna move us into some, some questions. I'm gonna ask you each a question, but please chip in with each other's if you'd like to, to bring in some thoughts of your own. So Zach, maybe I'll, I'll come to you first to hear a little bit more about the work at the New York uh, City Economic Development Commission. And, and I think I'm particularly interested in the barriers or challenges that you're facing in implementation. You mentioned some of the areas of focus before, yeah. workforce development, uh, being implementation of Local Law 97, which is a fantastic piece of regulation. Um, but yeah, we'd love to hear a bit more about those barriers and really w what you're doing I in your organization to overcome them. Yeah, absolutely. When it comes to retrofits and what you are touching on at the beginning, there's so many challenges that I think the greatest ones are from the, in the lack of expertise on what to do whenever uh, to reuse the building and reuse uh, materials that are in place and really the American culture of building new instead of uh, using what we have. But uh, relevant to this panel, uh, some of the really largest challenges we have are around energy use. And so one, um, once we build and complete a building, 
um, getting it to perform in the way that the energy model reflected is, is a proven to be a big challenge. And even if we do commissioning, we have the operators uh, at the table during design. We design for the set point temperatures that are going to be used on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. It's still shocking at how long it uh, takes and some of the complications uh, to actually get those numbers that, that were projected. Um, so we're trying to meet that challenge and maybe uh, more detailed specifications um, and in other ways. Yeah, I think Dan Foss may have some uh, great ideas on that. I think also the regarding energy is trying to get to net zero. And so with more straightforward programs like libraries, we've been able to do that. Our last two libraries are net zero energy. Um, that's where you have a, a lot, oftentimes a single story. Uh, you can implement operable windows. Um, there's really temperature that you need to maintain, but not so much uh, requirements on other aspects of uh, controls like that a library, or sorry, uh, art museum, or even a laboratory would have. So we have a laboratory project where we really try to get light into the lab spaces for the workers where they spend the vast majority of their day. And of course, the best design for a lab would be three foot w thick walls um, to, you know, have the humidity, temperature, and also uh, air exchange requirements that uh, use so much energy. But of course, nobody wants to work in that kind of environment. So we, in our last laboratory project, we have our, our labs, as you could think of it as cube, but, but then we had to, we can have glass around that, but we had to wrap that in our office program just to separate it that much from the edge. And so they're stepping back, but they're that, that access to daylight is, is just that much further away. And so finding those programs, we're just, we, we haven't found a way to come close to net zero energy use. And so that, that is a big challenge. Um, with an art museum project that we have going, it's similar um, with air, uh, air exchange, but really more with uh, humidity requirements. And then also, the, obviously, the quality of light needs to be a little bit different there. So those are uh, two really big challenges about controls but then also trying to meet our energy requirements and a healthy, you know, uh, great building that you want to be in at the same time. I think that's such an interesting example. Uh, Simei, I'm going to bring you in a second to think about just a little bit more about the daylighting point. But that real, you know, the, the use of a building, it's all well and good, isn't it? Sometimes us sat and saying, oh, you know, buildings need daylight and they need to be warm and they need to be comfortable. And then you think about, you know, actually how do people need to use these and work in them? And you've got all these kind of extra complications. So I think it's such a fantastic example to really set those challenges. Yeah, I think it's because at the end of the day, you have these competing forces of the city side that wants to keep the energy use low, but then you've got the users and the operators that are dealing with the day-to-day -day and a lot of workers' unions that have requirements for the maximum and minimum temperatures. So these forces are kind of battling each other during the operation of the building, and which adds to the challenges as well. Certainly as it's, well, maybe actually just before I come on to another point on daylighting. So all of those different requirements, regulations, can, can you see an answer? Can you see a way of kind of saying, okay, if we, if we just change these two or three things, that would, that would help us out in the case of New York? I think a lot of it is with culture and with, you know, what we can be comfortable with, not only um, in terms of the actual temperature in set points, but um, the environment itself. And I think getting people more accustomed to, um, to, being more flexible with what they're willing to work in. Um, they can, being willing to operate, oper open and close windows, um, go a little bit extra mile to, to find ways to, uh, to bring our, to our energy use down. Yeah. Great. And Sumay, I'd like to bring you in on that, just because of that point on daylighting and you know, being such a, a focus and, and I think passion, I could say, of yes. Velux as well, right? The Definitely. daylighting point. And, and so in, in those kind of examples where you've got labs, you've got different requirements. Uh, have you encountered those challenges and, and how Definitely. is, the, uh, yeah, what's the kind of Definitely. things you put in place? I mean, I can give you some of the examples actually from the uh, school projects uh, we have been doing actually across Denmark. We worked with like almost 30 schools uh, in Denmark exactly addressing those challenges around, you know, how do we improve the indoor, you know, uh, climate of the schools and also other public buildings by bringing more natural daylight uh, into the building. 
And then uh, we could actually, um, as part of this like uh, projects, also measure the impact in terms of like qualitative and the quantitative, you know, of improvement, uh, you know, for potentials we could see after the uh, renovation and re retrofit uh, projects. So you could see if you could uh, uh, bring in and utilize more natural daylight then you significantly reduce the need for you know electric light to start with which is again enough to you know uh, reducing the energy use and at the same time we have been seeing that the, the school kids have been you know feeling much better they were happier and then they were performing much much better in terms of like learning capability i mean data is showing that the school kids are actually with adequate daylight and also ventilation you know natural ventilation fresh air can uh, perform up to 15% uh, better, and that's actually quite significant. But the other thing I think is uh, what's interesting is that you mentioned this uh, behavior aspect. And you can model, and we also work a lot with simulation, you know, of, uh, trying to optimize what kind of solutions would bring the, the best benefits in terms of, again, energy and other health benefits. But uh, when it comes to, you know, you can design everything around those principles, but when it comes to how people actually then live and work in those environments is making a difference. So, and then you also need to, as part of these um, you know, projects we've been doing actually again in uh, housing and other sort of like projects, measuring also the behavior of the, the inhabitants actually of these buildings, which is giving significant you know, of, um, learnings, which then can be also applied in you know, optimizing your solutions. Smart solutions for heating, smart solutions you know, for, for how to operate the, the windows. Those needs to be actually to optimize. Of course, you can do by starting with increasing awareness so that the, the people actually do the right things, but you can also even further optimize by integrating the smart solutions. Um, to, to, to you know, for, um, make sure that the you know, windows are opening at the right time, the heating is switched off at the right time, and, um, and we just need to sort of like bring all these things together to find the right solutions. Great, thanks very much. Well, no, I, I, I like this now, I'm setting this up, so we'll get a challenge, you see, from our public sector, our city officials, and then we'll get a response from how the private sector can also contribute, and then we'll hopefully end up with some new solutions in the middle. That's my, my logic for today. So, Monica, you mentioned before some of the real issues that you're facing in Warsaw and needing these challenges, uh, and, and needing this kind of systemic uh, approach. What are some of the barriers that you're really facing in implementing programs or the strategies to tackle air quality, to switch away from coal stoves, to really put in your new building codes? What are some of the challenges you have? So I think the, the biggest challenges, uh, well, they're on different levels as well. Uh, of course, there are like uh, financial challenges, but as you mentioned, it's not necessary that you have to invest a lot. And I think uh, here the we have to just kind of conduct and educate people uh, how to do it and find some partnership how to deliver kind of new quality, especially for the new housing. Uh, because in Warsaw, we have one of the biggest heating system in Europe, uh, but now we have to change it. So we don't like to uh, kind of put new buildings on the system because we know that uh, we have to switch to more local systems. And we have to uh, change the sources uh, uh, for the energy. So that, that is under transition. This is, not, this is challenging because in, uh, it's in the private hands. Uh, so actually more state policy can regulate it. But again, we, we have to show good examples how we're going to, to manage like municipal uh, buildings, municipal uh, transportation system, because we have actually very big fleet of uh, uh, buses run on uh, electricity, and then uh, really extensive tram uh, and metro system. Uh, so we all understand that with the energy prices going higher and higher, we need our own energy source. Uh, so that's uh, that what municipality now is trying to solve, build their own capacity. 
And uh, so that's one challenge. The other challenge is actually how to construct new buildings. Uh, and here, very important will be sort of interaction with private sector, with public-private partnerships. And I think we should set very high standards and then find a way uh, how to achieve it in a dialogue. Yeah, I think that's the, the most uh, urgent issues. Yeah, well, they're big, they're big challenges to have. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, on, on the municipal leadership with that size of fleet and the assets, it's uh, amazing to be seeing the kind of leading by example of Warsaw and saying we have to find our own way of, of managing out of this. And, and maybe, Rasmus, on the public-private partnerships that Monica's talking about, can you tell us a bit more about how, how Danfoss is operating in that way? How do you kind of work with cities for those challenges? And, and also, what you think some of the best technical solution, technological solutions are to some of these issues? Thanks. There's, um, uh, there's a lot on the table now, and I'd love to respond both to uh, Sachs' point on uh, some of the barriers uh, in, in New York City, but also on, on Warsaw, and, and maybe... Um, uh, starting with, uh, with, with with Warsaw and some of the, the challenges that you're facing, I think I, we as a company would very much agree with the approach you have taken in the sense that we need to see the, the city as, a, as an ecosystem uh, and, and, and try to encourage a little more holistic uh, planning uh, of the energy systems and how it interacts with the, with the rest of the city. Um, a little advertisement here, we just published a, a small white paper, so I hope uh, Velux will forgive me for, from, uh, from sporting that here, but it's basically a roadmap for how to, to decarbonize cities, exactly using some of the technologies that, uh, um, and solutions that, uh, that, of course, we make, but th that other companies make as well, but, uh, but where perhaps the awareness is not, uh, not fully there. Um, but the, but the, the, crew, the key thing is still this kind of uh, a more, uh, more holistic planning uh, to what we're doing. And I think if you just look at Warsaw, I think you have uh, a couple of, uh, of, of, of good things going for you, actually. Uh, one thing is, is exactly your, your heating system, the, your district heating system. This is something that is, I mean, you find it here in Denmark and some of the other Nordic countries, but uh, you don't have that in the, in, in the US, for example, a district heating system, except for a few university campuses, perhaps. But this is something you find in throughout Eastern Europe, and it's a huge asset as an enabler uh, for an energy system in a city. And why is that? You, you also mentioned that um, that you would like to have your own energy sources. And in fact, you have quite a few in Warsaw because you have a lot of excess heat. This is another key point I think we uh, in Danfoss would like to make that throughout Europe, um, there is unused potential of excess heat corresponding more or less to uh, approximately 3,000 terawatt hours. So that's Europe's entire consumption of heat in buildings, including uh, hot water, could be powered by excess heat alone. So excess heat from uh, industry, excess heat from uh, smaller things like supermarkets, data centers, uh, the London Metro, lots of excess heat. You find it everywhere. And we have the technology now to actually uh, harvest it uh, and, and capture it and, and then reuse it. And the best way to do that, you can do it in the various ways, but the best way is if you have a district heating system. Because then suddenly uh, it's a game changer and, and, and you can use it. Of course, over time you need to make sure that the district heating systems are fitted so they can also handle lower temperatures. You use heat pumps to, to basically bring it up. But, but that's another story. But, but, but the point here is, again, there are some technologies and a lot of cities have heat sources available that they are currently not using all over the world. So it's a great example. So I'm based in London, and yeah, in the north of London, there's a project that extracts excess heat from the London metro or underground system. And if you've been on it, it's hot. So there's a lot of excess hot, heat yeah. there. And it's uh, used to heat a leisure center and swimming pool. And so that project's called Bun Hill Project. It's a cool one to check out. It's very nice. And a very nice example of public-private partnership, actually, it really came and, together. And, and that's actually, if I may, that's, a, that's the whole point. Because the reason why these things are not utilized yet, because the technology is there, the payback time is short. I mean, what's not to like? But it's exactly because we cannot get these partnerships going. Because it's not something you can just regulate. You can regulate a little bit. But ultimately, you, lead, you need very various stakeholders to get around a table and say, okay, we can benefit from working together. You have the excess energy, I need it, how can we work this out? Yes, ex exactly that. And, uh, and I think it's amazing when, when you point to one of those working in a city, in a country, everybody's like, oh yeah, of course we should have that partnership. But it's been really quite painful sometimes to, yeah. get, to get to that point. That's great. So, so I'd like to, to move us on to some questions we touched on before about 
workforce development. I'm aware here we've got two very large employers. You have a huge amount of workforce, and I'm sure you're also seeing the need for, for, for different skills, for new skills when we move to a, a bigger rollout of, of low carbon technologies and how we kind of transition to that point. And I think certainly from, from our cities here, we're seeing workforce development it is a barrier to being able to implement at scale, whether it's on the new build level, whether it's on retrofit. And so, yeah, I'd love to kind of explore that a little bit more and, uh, and see what happens. So, Zach, maybe I can start with you to explain some of that. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think to, to maybe frame it uh, more specific to what we're trying to do, um, and is that it upskill the workers? And so we, we do have some workers, of course, with trade experience, um, but also ones with no experience. So really identifying uh, the real you know, key levers in, in terms of like the green workforce, uh, what, what jobs are going to be the highest paying and most in demand. Um, so it'd be great to hear if uh, from the, you know, the technology side, what what the potential is for inexperienced workers to train them and get them into these uh, jobs that are going to be more in demand with the green economy. Uh, because, you know, a big challenge for us, you know, at the end of the day, uh, retrofitting, uh, deconstructing is, you know, very costly. And trying to make that work in, you know, a highly uh, capitalistic society, you would have, we need to make it work financially. And sometimes, like, that's probably going to end up where you're just going to have to make it more costly to demolish and to throw away. So where do those costs end up going? And, and what you know, we try to be concerned with is driving those costs back into the communities themselves so that we're not simply just making construction costlier for the sake of that happening and then driving out people you know, that are, are in these communities, but empowering them and making that drive the workforce. So uh, it'd be great to hear like what, yeah, either specialized and non-specialized workers, uh, what the potential is if, you know, given the technologies that you guys work with. Well, maybe I can ask one of you to, to come in now, or maybe we can also hear the, the issue from Monica, and then we can ask for some combined responses. I think that's a, sorry, just a great point, Zach, you made on that kind of a uh, demolishing rather than preserving new and how we kind of change those whole incentive regimes. I was hearing yesterday that in, in Denmark, there's a a tax if, that, that stays that you have to pay if you keep a building and renovate it. So yeah. during your kind of construction phase. But if you've knocked it down, the tax goes away. You know, mm -hmm. so you've got you therefore make a saving if you like in comparison to your, if you're building new rather than rather than renovating at scale. I thought it was a very interesting example, and it, I'm I'm pretty sure it's not unique to Denmark. I'm sure that's in the, in the case in many many countries. So Monica, on workforce development and skills, what are some of the issues you're facing in Warsaw? Well, I personally very like the approach do it yourself and it's uh, one of the way you can actually train people how to improve their own uh, environment. Uh, but what we're facing at the moment is something else on the construction industry actually. We have uh, not enough workers because uh, they're all kind of uh, move uh, to other countries uh, because the income is higher there. Uh, so the, on the construction side, there's really not uh, enough people. So even uh, if we're talking about uh, training people, there is nobody to be trained. Uh, uh, so that's uh, the big obstacle. Uh, how the companies are dealing with it? Yeah, that's uh, technology. It's uh, sometimes helping, but at the moment, just the cost of construction is going higher. And, and are you seeing any of those companies working with schools or other education facilities to try and encourage people, young, young, uh, young people in Warsaw to, or in Poland, to try and stay within the construction sector? Uh, you know, it's, it's a capital, so it's kind of uh, highly qualified people are kind of... Uh, attracted uh, to be there and there is a lot of work in services and in education uh, but uh, yes yeah, still we do have schools because this we are uh, going back to the schooling system we have schools that are actually having training uh, for construction and so on and i think uh, for the future maybe there is a hope but we have like now a problem Yes, a now problem, yeah, yeah, see that. Um, so, Simai, maybe I can come to you about, you know, the, it, any role or contribution that, that Velux is making, or also, are you seeing the same challenge? You know, are you also yeah. with your knowledge of the sector, and what kind of solutions do you think there could be? Yeah. I'll start with the first question. So, 
in terms of like you know upskilling you know the existing workforce and etc i think you need to start with a systematic approach to first of all identify where do you see the biggest needs of what kind of like skills you know for coming into demand and then i'll go back to again the the tool actually we are developing together cassie with c40 because you start with identifying the opportunities and the benefits uh, by looking at the different retrofit strategies. And then part of the sort of like evaluation is also the job creation that comes with it, depending on the which strategy uh, you are actually moving forward with. And then you, Monica, mentioned like um, that you have uh, similar typologies in the cities. These are, you know, fantastic sort of like opportunities where you can actually apply these tools to identify scalable retrofit strategies, which will also highlight the need for a certain workforce to be upskilled. So you can actually long term start planning. How do I do that? What kind of people do I need to upskill? What kind of skills do I need? And etc. And I think that could be actually quite uh, interesting, you know, test. Yeah. We can also try to do with both cities actually to, to see if we can uh, sort of like forecast and uh, plan a bit more systematic towards developing these skill sets that's going to be needed uh, with the right starting point. And um, another thing, an example, um, what we do is we, I, I, I need to mention this because we are so proud of this project, uh, the living places, uh, which we're exhibiting at the moment, uh, you know, in the city center in Copenhagen is also part of the UIA Congress now, you can go and visit it. This is where we have also sort of like worked together um, with the other like um, uh, partners in the industry where we brought you know, the, the building owner, where we brought the architect, uh, the constructor, the engineer around the, the same uh, table, basically, to try to uh, address these biggest challenges in terms of also like new building. Uh, how do we create the lowest possible carbon footprint building and with the best uh, indoor climate? And it's about, again, bringing the expertise that is needed to address those challenges into the same room throughout the process and um, it's also important that we do that with an open-minded sort of like setup and then we share the learnings and uh, the knowledge we also create through these collaborations and that's also as Velux what we do you know if you for example want to understand what kind of principles we have uh, worked with what kind of like know-how did we create what kind of tools did we actually uh, develop to uh, create this solution you can actually have access to that. It's open source and then you can learn from it. And it's again, I, I think just repeating myself, but it's really, really important, as you also said, that we start working together, share the knowledge and the expertise we have, and then really utilize more and more the public and uh, private sector uh, collaboration. Thank, thanks very much. And I, I went to see Living Places yesterday. It's pretty cool. So if you haven't been yet, please, please go and check it out. It's a great example to actually be able to go and visit. So, so Rasmus, how about the, the work of Danfoss, where you see some of these uh, improvements can be made, how we can really stimulate this workforce and, and get that increase of uh, implementation of technologies too? Yeah, it's, this is, of course, an incredibly complex problem. I think... Um, I think Monica put it nicely with, you know, it's, it's, it's really a, there's a distinct problem with simply a lack of workforce and then you have a skills problem and the two also related. <laughs> but if we dissect a little bit, I would say on the workforce, and I think this has, at least over the past couple of years, has been the main problem seen from our perspective, that we simply cannot find the people to roll out the technology fast enough. There are not enough installers in Europe to roll out heat pumps or other forms of uh, you know, advanced technologies uh, and install them. So I think the solution to that, at least in the short term, is actually to look for technologies and solutions that are not labor intensive. And I think this is where the digital solutions comes in. Uh, and I think people don't quite understand the game changer this is also for energy efficiency. How much you can achieve s simply through digital means. Um, we sell now a, a number of products that also solve some of the, I think, problems like the SAC mentioned with the behavior and the reason why buildings actually do not perform as they were expected. And a lot of that can be addressed through digital controls. And there we are in a very different place than we were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. The use of artificial intelligence, which we now use a lot for predictive models in, in buildings, has 
you know, generates enormous benefits. It can predict exactly how people behave based on historical data. Uh, it makes sure that, again, when the sun shines on a building, you switch off all the, uh, all the heating sources and, and so forth, so everything is regulated. Um, and the energy efficiency gains just from digital solutions. We have one called Lean Heat uh, for our district heating uh, that basically controls the heat go that goes into large uh, skyscrapers or large uh, housing, uh, uh, housing um, uh, blocks, right? Uh, is around 10 to 15%. It's a digital solution. It takes three hours to install if you have sensors also in the apartments. But, but basically, it is not labor intensive. So this is a, really a way to bypass the workforce problem. And I think we'll see more of that. The second problem uh, then relates to skills, and that's another impediment. Uh, we see many places that we don't find the, the right number of qualified people. In a place like Africa, for example, we are working a lot on training people to install uh, cold chain solutions so they can cool the food they produce. Uh, and unless we do that, unless we start with there, it's never going to roll out. So, so this is simply the first place and the most important thing to focus on. And then technology is actually okay and the payback times are good and they can finance it, but there are nobody who can maintain, install and run it. So we need to start there. But of course, in Europe, it's a slightly different matter. But then I think it's also a question of, of really looking at the, the right spots. I think an interesting project that we are working on in Germany now is to look at a little bit, you know, where do we find sort of sectors or groups of people that you could sort of reskill, but where it's actually close enough that it would make sense. And I think a fun example to me is uh, we had discussions with chimney sweepers. This is a bit of a sunset industry in Europe in terms of, in, in the sense that regulation over the next 10 years will basically phase out a lot of, most of the uh, sort of uh, private, uh, you know, uh, uh, fireplaces and what have you. So, so, so their business will go down. But why don't we start, since they go into people's houses anyway and reskill them and learn them, for example, how to uh, do a boiler check or, or something like that. So I think th these are the kind of innovative ways of, of working that we, we need to, to perhaps uh, investigate further to both upskill and, and get the workforce that we simply cannot find at the moment. Super interesting. Uh, at, at C40, we do quite a lot of work on the just transition and thinking about how we can support cities to transition workers from one industry to another. I don't think we've thought about the chimney sweep industry, so I'm going to look to my colleagues to make a note of that because we must talk to our, to our just transition colleagues when we get back to the office. Thank they you very much. They need more work in the future, so they're, they're game. They want to talk. Yeah, it, it, exactly. You know, they, they shouldn't be left without, yeah. without work and because of regulation. I think it's, it's such an important point. So uh, we're coming, time flies. We're coming to the end of our session. So, I mean, a huge thanks to all of you. Very interesting. I'm, I'm going to come to each of you for just a final remarks, really. And I, I guess I'd like to hear two things. One, what have you taken away from this session? What, what's been useful? What's been the useful thing that you've heard? And number two, what do you want? What do you need next? What's your most urgent need in terms of public-private collaboration? So. Monica, to put you on the spot, maybe I can come to you first. Uh, yeah, I think with this uh, working force, how to change it, that, was, that is very remarkable. And we should uh, search actually what are the different groups that they are going to lose their profession or like what is the unemployment rate in different sectors and how you may train these people because it will be in their own interest. The other thing is like, uh, I think the awareness that we should have uh, about these small smart solutions uh, at uh, each building is uh, it's very important. And I think like more research and monitoring uh, should take place as well in Warsaw. Uh, yeah, and the biggest challenge is actually how really start to work across uh, sectors because so far I, mm, I'm participating in a lot of discussion with different groups and everyone is agreed that we need a tool for cooperation. But still, you know, the, the tool is not yet there, so we have to start really, we have to try that we have to try it day by day and find a ways to, to cooperate and finance it. Thank you. Zach? I uh, think the takeaway for me is thinking a little bit more about the challenges that I mentioned about behavioral and the operation of public buildings and what, how technologies can assist with that. Um, mainly the problem that you know, public sector budgets are always stretched, the operation is difficult. 
it's typically the person uh, who has a lot of other job responsibilities that's expected to maintain the, the temperature of the building. And then often, in a lot of cases, the only definitive thing they can say is that the building's not running as it probably should. And so it, it hopefully artificial intelligence or other technologies can help with this. Like for a librarian, for example, who has to ensure that the kids aren't destroying things, the bathrooms are clean, and yet the windows are operating and everything's maintained correctly. So uh, people that have all of these concerns and, and not a lot of expertise, being able to operate the building, there seems to be such a, a, a gigantic opportunity there. Uh, what we need, um, I think we need the participation of the private sector to help uh, upskill these workers and find opportunities to train our labor forces in a way that benefits both the the companies and you know ideally implementing their systems and then of course like our workers themselves being able to upskill and, and grow their uh, their incomes thank you Simai. I think everything starts with awareness first you know if, um, based on the examples you were giving you know the behavior of the people we need to basically start changing them with uh, increasing the awareness so that we can actually start with the little steps which can actually have big impact in terms of you know, improving uh, energy efficiency and how we live basically. And then we also need to bring this like systematic approach, I think, to identify the bigger opportunities, which we need to address with technology and with bigger like sort of like more in-depth renovation projects. And there we need to sort of like work together, utilize the tools we are developing to identify again where to start and bring this holistic approach in terms of like also benefit realization, which will also help with the financing challenges we are facing. Because if you only look at maybe the, uh, the energy performance, then you might be, you know, for not getting the uh, benefits in terms of like health improvements, you know, reduction in uh, healthcare costs and things like that. So the holistic approach and the collaboration and uh, finding the solutions all together. That's my takeaway. Fantastic. Thank you. Erasmus. I can only uh, echo what, what others have said here. I think the awareness part is, is, is actually crucial. I think for me that has been the, um, the biggest perhaps revelation uh, over the past couple of years again with the energy crisis and so on that it's not really only a question of regulation, lack of funding, all the normal challenges that we, we talk about, but actually a lot of it comes down to, to, to lack of awareness. And that then leads to the second point, which is that, that we need this kind of, you know, both partnerships, but also more dialogue, also between the private sector and, and the public sector. I myself come from the from government, that's my, my, my background, and the, and the public sector. And I can see now joining the private sector how the two parties are very good at, uh, you know, not really talking the same language. Uh, I think in, in the private sector, I can see a lot of my colleagues, they have really difficulties explaining what we do in a way that is not so much the specific technology as you would to a corporate client, but more like what is the solution that we can provide, which is the language that politicians and civil servants speak and vice versa. And sometimes I think in, at, the, at the government level, we also have difficulties explaining, you know, what, is it, what, it, what are our needs and, and how does that fit with technology? So, so I think this is the, the dialogues that we need to stimulate and hopefully that, that leads to more sort of in-depth partnerships that can really unlock this potential that is clearly there. Uh, I think that's a great point. It's kind of a, a need for, for almost translation between the sectors because I think there is sometimes that, that gap just due to a lack of understanding. So we've come to the end of the session. I want to say a huge thank you to you all for your comments today and for your time. I think we've learned about the challenges that are being faced by the public and private sector in terms of dealing with the energy crisis through implementation and acceleration of retrofit. But importantly for me, we've heard action. We've heard about solutions, we've hopefully inspired each other, and we've really understood how we can overcome some of those with public-private partnerships. So, uh, Rasmus, Simai, Zach, and Monica, huge thank you, and enjoy the rest of your time at the UIA. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.